Hey everybody, this is the voiceover PowerPoint for the biliary lecture, um, the assessment and management of patients with biliary, biliary disorders. So I'm kind of throwing this together at a fast pace so that you guys can start reviewing this as soon as possible because we, you will be responsible for the content of this on the quiz on Monday. Um, like I said in my email, the good news is it's only one chapter. Um, oh, it's actually chapter 44. Um, I, I meant to change that. Um, so it's, it's actually chapter 44 of your Brunner 15th edition. Um, but the good news is, is it is a very short chapter and, um, there's not that much, it's not that many diseases or diagnoses that you guys have to learn about. Not unlike, you know, the reproductive or pulmonary um, or even GI, you know, this is just a small piece of the GI system um, that we're going to be looking at. So really the two main things that we're going to be looking at, the two main disorders um, is the, or the two main organs are the gallbladder and the pancreas. So when we think of diseases um, and diagnoses, we think of cholelithiasis um, or, you know, when we're looking at the gallbladder, cholelithiasis as well as um, pancreatitis, okay? All right, so we need to have an understanding of the anatomy and physiology of what the biliary system does, um, what its function is, what it's responsible for, um, and the purpose of it in our body. We have to have an understanding of it in order to understand um, the diseases and diagnoses that go along the lines of gallbladder disease and acute and chronic pancreatitis. All right, so you need to have an understanding of the pathophys. So what does the gallbladder do? What is it responsible for? It's a, a tiny little pear-shaped organ um, that's connected to our common bile duct, right, that you guys learned about with the, the hepatic system. So it's, it's connected to the common bile duct or also known as the CBD. You'll see it used abbreviated um, when we're looking through Saurian or looking through Epic, whenever we're looking at notes um, and charting, it's known as the CBD, which is the common bile duct. So our gallbladder is connected to the gall, uh, the gallbladder is connected to the common bile duct and it can hold about 30 to 50 cc's or milliliters of bile. Okay, it acts as a storage container for bile. That's its main, main function. So when food enters the duodenum, the gallbladder then contracts, right? And the sphincter of Adi or Odi, however you pronounce it, I always call it Adi, um, relaxes. The sphincter relaxes, which then allows for that bile to enter into the intestine. So when the hormone, um, or I'm sorry, the hormone that's secreted in response to that is the CCK, the cholecystokinin. So you guys may have heard of that kind of a hormone somewhere, um, throwing it back in your memories of A and P. So the CCK really acts as a major stimulus for the digestive enzymes, and it acts by stimulating that gallbladder to contract. So remember, when the gallbladder contracts, it allows the sphincter of body to relax, which then allows the bile to then go into um, the intestines. So what happens when it becomes obstructed, whether there's an obstruction in our common bile duct or an obstruction in the gallbladder, such as with gallstones, right? Um, bile can't get into that intestine. So it doesn't enter into the intestines and therefore our billy levels tend to rise, right? Because we can't excrete it from our body. The pancreas, um, the pancreas has both exocrine and endocrine hormone secretion functions. So exocrine, we know that word, um, that lat, that's a Latin or Greek term for external and endocrine, which is internal, okay? So some secretions of the exocrine system are the digestive enzymes like uh, the amylase, lipase, and trypsin. So those you may be familiar with because you may recognize those on like your comprehensive metabolic profiles. We look at the patient's amylase, trypsin, the, lys um, the lipase, right? We usually look at that to see if there's any kind of hepatobiliary um, dysfunction or dysregulation. So those are 
the hormones of the exocrine um, system, the ex exocrine function of the pancreas. Okay, some endocrine functions. These are include secretions of insulin, glucagon, and the somatostatin, which are directly released into the bloodstream. Okay, so it, it's kind of it's got a couple things going on that the pancreas is responsible for. We've got all these exocrine hormones that they're responsible for, for as well as the endocrine um, uh, hormone secretion. So what happens when the pancreas becomes impaired, digestion and hormone imbalance ultimately becomes altered. So we have to look at not only digestion, you know, we're not thinking just the GI system, but we're also looking at that hormonal imbalance when we're talking about the pancreas. So you need to make sure that you look, you know, it can become very complicated when we're looking at uh, disorders of the pancreas. So I'm just going to talk real briefly about this slide. Um, if we were in lecture in person, I was going to show you a nice brief video from Khan Academy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Khan Academy or you may have heard of it. Um, I like to look at their videos when it comes to like pathophys stuff because I think that it's a nice visual um, audio representation. Um, you know, it's nice and colorful. So I wasn't able to put in the hyperlink and pull it up here on the voiceover PowerPoint. I tried. I promise you I tried. Um, I wasn't able to do it. I think I would have been able to do it if, if this was like maybe a Zoom presentation. But any, anyhow, any regardless, is um, what I'm going to do is post that link of the video that I was going to show you. Um, it's just about five minutes long speaking about the biliary tree um, and the function of the liver, the gallbladder, the common bile, Dr. Duodenum, pancreas, all, all of this stuff and what it uh, represents. So I'll be posting that along with my voiceover PowerPoint, okay? All right. Coley's cholelithiasis or cholecystitis, right? I'm sure you guys have heard of, um, by now, as senior year level nursing students, cholecystectomies. I'm sure that you've taken care of a patient, maybe not fresh post-op cholecystectomy, but those that have had a past medical history of having a cholecystectomy, or pa let's say past medical history of cholelithiasis, past surgical history of cholecystectomy, right? A very common procedure, common disorder um, nowadays. Okay, so we're gonna start with the gallbladder and then we'll be working our way to the pancreas. So cholecystitis, so we know we can break that down, right? Any kind of an itis means inflammation, right? Chole is the, the Greek term for uh, the gallbladder, right? When you look at lithiasis, you know that that's kind of a stone formation. Um, so cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. And this can be either an acute attack or a chronic attack, okay? Then you have to look at the calculus cholecystitis, okay? Calculus cholecystitis accounts for about over 90% of acute cases. Um, and this is where there's an obstruction of the bile outflow that's caused by a stone. <coughs> Excuse me. So the obstruction by the calculus, calculus cholecystitis, is obstruction caused by the, a stone, okay? So the bile accumulates in the gallbladder, which causes compression of the blood vessels from the edema, which then causes vascular changes. So what this can lead to is uh, gangrene and ultimately perforation, okay, which is really bad. Hey, uh, bacteria can be a cause, um, but usually just a small percentage of the cause. So this can happen because of bacteria, but only in a small percentage of the population um, that this may be a cause of this. Um, but it can also cause, this can cause a secondary infection, um, typically by like E. coli or Klebsiella, as well as strep, right, which is found normally in the GI tract as one of the normal flora organisms. So the, the calculus cholecystitis is when there's an obs obstruction of the bile outflow caused by a stone. And we're going to talk on the next slide about two different types of stones. There's the pigment stones and then there's the cholesterol stones, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. A calculus 
um, cholecystitis. Well, well, A, anytime you see the word A, that means without, right? So without calculus, without stone formation, cholecystitis. So this is inflammation without gallstone, without gallstone obstruction. This can be a result from surgeries, um, some kind of orthopedic procedures, certain types of orthopedic procedures, trauma, as well as burns. Okay, so burn victims may be um, at risk for the acalculus cholecystitis, so some inflammation um, without gallstones. It's usually a direct result from alterations within the fluid and electrolyte balance. So remember, we throwing it back to nursing too, like right off the first, right when you got out of the gates, we threw at you fluid and electrolyte imbalances. You may have learned back then that some of the imbalances within the fluid and lights can cause cholelithiasis, but the kind that doesn't have uh, stone formation, right? So no gallstone obstruction, okay? Um, cholelithiasis, these are our gallstones. Um, more prevalent in women um, that are of ages over 50 years of age, okay? But 5 to 20% in women ages 20 to 55, um, are at risk for this. Okay, so 5 to 20% of women that are in the ages between 20 and 55 um, are at risk for the development of cholelithiasis or gall gallstones. It does seem to be more prevalent in women that are greater of 50, but just know that also a large percentage of the population are starting from women, uh, starting from ages 20 to 55 as well. Also, um, those that are um, ages 20 to 45, so like in their 40s, um, those of multi-parity, so those have had, that have had many childbirth, um, and obesity. Okay. Um, so there's two types of gallstones. Those can contain, I'm sorry, those composed of pigment and those primarily of cholesterol. And like I said, I'm going to show you... Um, an example on the following slide. So the pigment stones, the pigment stones are made from unconjugated bile. Um, so remember, or not remember, but you guys will learn about conjugated bilirubin versus unconjugated bilirubin. Um, that's a really in detail within A and P, but the pigment stones are from unconjugated bile, which can be caused by patients that have cirrhosis, um, any kind of heme disorder, so any kind of a hematological disorder, like hemolysis, um, and any infections of the biliary tract. Those are um, those patients are at risk for de the development of the pigment stones, right? Um, these types of stones, these pigment stones, they can't be dissolved. They're not made of plaque. They're not made of cholesterol. Um, these have to be surgically removed. So if the obstruction is being caused by a pigment stone, we have to go in and surgically remove it. I apologize for the squeaking. My dogs are deciding to play right now. Okay, cholesterol stones, these are the most frequent, most common ones. So these develop in about, or these are about 75% of the gallstone cases. So anytime you see a patient that has a, a cholelithiasis, some kind of gallstones, Three quarters of the patients with gallstones are from cholesterol stones, okay? And these cholesterol saturated stones, they cause irritation and inflammation to the mucosal lining of the gallbladder. Um, so these are ones that we actually can um, dissolve and see if we can get rid of it that way, okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit more about risk factors. Um, so the risk factors, which we kind of already discussed, um, are, you know, it's more prevalent in women, um, those who are have had multiparity. So those of you that don't have never worked in OB or are unfamiliar with it, that means um, multiple labors, multiple births, okay, multiparity. So if they've had many kids and those that are overweight, so 40, fertile, and fluffy is my way of remembering that, okay? Women, more prevalent in women that are 40, fertile, and fluffy. All right, so here is um, our, the pictures of the gallstones. And these, I took these right from 
your Brunner chapter. All these pictures here are right from Brunner. So the picture on the left here, these are our cholesterol stones. Okay, so these are these are the types of stones. Like I said, 75% of gallstone cases are from this here. These stones, these cholesterol stones, we can dissolve. So we can dissolve them. Um, you know, there's different ways we'll talk on upcoming slides on how we can dissolve them, but they can get dissolved. Um, and then we go in and do like a biliary sweep where we go through and sweep out the sludge um, as well as the stones. And then this is a picture of the pigment stones. Like I said, these can't be uh, these can't be dissolved. You can't dissolve them with the uh, lithotripsy or wave shock therapy or any kind of medication um, to go in and sweep them out. But they have to be surgically removed. Okay, these are the pigment stones um, that are made up of calcium bilirubinate. Okay. All right, clinical manifestations of cholelithiasis. So the cholecystitis, right, inflammation of the gallbladder alone can cause pain, tenderness, and rigidity in the right upper quadrant that radiates to the mid-sternal. So it, it's pain and tenderness and rigidity noted in the right upper quadrant. So it's typically felt like below the right rib, really. Um, and it can radiate to a medial stinal, so mid-sternum. Uh, usually can be accompanied with nausea and vomiting and it can lead epigastric distress. So epigastric, which can be confused with maybe heartburn or reflux, um, epigastric distress and fullness or distension can occur after ingestion of fatty or fried foods. So anytime we eat something that actually has flavor to it, it can trigger us to have um, that epigastric distress and bloating or, or fullness slash distension after eating fried or fatty foods. So the pain, like I said, the pain and biliary, and biliary colic. Um, biliary colic is pain that kind of comes and goes, off and on, comes and goes. Um, and this is usually associated by contraction of the gallbladder. Um, so the contraction of the gallbladder, which in, in, in a way it can't, release the bile because of the obstructed stone so it's not releasing bile um and it's not you know it's causing that contraction of the gallbladder which isn't releasing the bile which its whole purpose is because of the obstruction so it's usually accompanied with nausea and vomiting um and the patient usually is just unable to get into a comfortable position so you know when we think of pain we always think of one of the non-pharmacological things we can do is positioning right positioning can help us decrease the pain patients with this kind of gallbladder pain they just can't seem to find a comfortable position for it to kind of go away or for them to feel relieved with okay sometimes the pain can be constant instead of colicky coming and going okay so um Pain meds, we wanna make sure that we're giving them pain meds, analgesics and morphine, okay? Um, so we wanna make sure that we've got some analgesics on board as well as um, morphine. Now there was some controversy, I don't know, you'll probably read this in your book, there was some controversy with the morphine as the morphine ten, ha, tends to have an effect on the sphincter of Adi. So kind of the old practice was don't administer the morphine for patients that have had or that have cho cholelithiasis it may not be the drug of choice because of those reasons um, but research is finding that morphine is very effective when it comes to the acute gallbladder um, pain and the biliary colic that they feel associated with the gallstone attacks Okay, so you need to make sure pain is going to be one of our priorities here. Um, analgesics, morphine, you want to get that on board for these pa patients that are having pain because no position and nothing is really going to take the pain away. So if a stone gets passed and it no longer is obstructing, um, then the inflammatory process subsides, right? But if it doesn't, if it doesn't get passed, um, what it can lead to is an abscess necrosis which can then lead to perforation right and then if it perforates if we have an abdominal perforation that can lead to peritonitis septicemia which then um, leads to mods right multi-organ dysfunction syndrome um, so 
you want to note, um, you know, if the patient does have a stone, you want to keep an eye on it because if it doesn't get past, it can really cause all of these problems, ultimately septicemia, which can be lethal. Okay. Um, so that's it really with the, the pain and the biliary colic. Jaundice is also going to be another uh, common symptom. All right. It's usually seen with an obstruction of the common bile duct but it also can be with the um, obstruction within the gallbladder as well. Um, so what's happening is the bile, like I said, doesn't reach the duodenum. Therefore, it gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream, causing a high level of bilirubin in the blood, right? Or my favorite nurse word ever, medical term, hyperbilirubinemia, right? <laughs> um, so you're going to see... Um, puritis of the skin. Patients are going to have itchy skin. They can have a yellowish tint to the skin, the jaundice, as well as uh, jaundice in their mucous membranes. So their sclera of their eyes, um, it may be in their gums. Okay, you may see some jaundice. Now changes in the stool color, um, changes in urine and stool color. So bile pigments um, excreted in the kidneys give a, our stools a dark color. So the bile pigment that are excreted in the kidneys naturally give our stools those dark colors, right? What happens is when there's no bile pigments in our stool because it can't reach the intestine to then be excreted, um, we have grayish or clay colored stools, okay? So gray or pale clay colored stools um, is going to be an indication of some kind of a bile obstruction, okay? Um, vitamin deficiency. So when we're thinking of our vitamin deficiency, we're thinking of the fat soluble vitamins here. Um, Cade, right? Cade are our vat, our fat voluble sites. Vat, fat, fat, oh my God, I think I'm going to give up. Fat soluble vitamins, K-A-D-E. Um, so obstruction of the bile flow causes interference with the absorption of these fat soluble vitamins, um, causing a deficiency in our vitamin K, A, D, and E. So what out of all of those are we really concerned about when it comes to fat-soluble vitamins is mainly our vitamin K, right? That's responsible for our bleeding and coagulation. So if these patients are having deficiencies in the fat soluble in the vitamin K, then they're gonna we're gonna monitor them for bleeding, right? So clinical manifestations may be they're they're bleeding. Okay. All right, diagnostic tests. So some things that we're going to look at to, to diagnose and, and kind of rule out um, cholecystitis or cholelithiasis is ultrasound is the best way. I know it's number two on my list here, um, but ultrasound um, is the procedure of choice because it's fast and it doesn't expose patients um, to radiation. So it's something that we can, um, you know, order right away, um, get them in, get them out, get some kind of a diagnosis under our belt. Whereas an MRI needs a little bit more preparation, right? A little bit more, um, you know, you need the appointment for the MRI, you need to be questioned, um, had the checklist, you need to be prepped for it. Um, so ultrasound is actually gonna be one of the first things that we do to diagnose. Um, and if need be, get an MRI. Now we're also gonna do blood work. Right, so we're gonna do our typical CBC and our comp levels because remember we talked about um, all those biliary digestive enzymes that can be out of whack, the amylase, the lipase, the AST, the ALT. But we also wanna look at the cholesterol levels, right? Remember I said 75% of the cholelithiasis come from cholesterol saturated stones. So we might wanna get a cholesterol level. Take a look at the patient's um, triglycerides, their HDL, HDLs, LDLs, triglyceride levels to see where they're at with that in terms of their cholesterol levels, okay? And we're going to see their cholesterol levels elevated in a biliary obstruction, okay? We also um, maybe will do an exploratory laparotomy. So, uh, or, I'm sorry, exploratory laparoscopy. So we kind of go in, um, exploratory, we go in through the laparoscopic way to diagnose, to see what our findings are. Um, and we can also do an MRCP, which is similar to the ERCP, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the MRCP is the magnetic 
resonance um, choleangio pancreatography. So the MRCP can be specific to the, the, the biliary system. Okay. Which, so moving right along, um, medical management. So we're going to send them for the procedures, okay, for the cholelithiasis, the, the MRCP, and then there's the ERCP. All right. The MRCP is just visualization using film. So this is the magnetic resonance choleangiopancreatography, whereas the ERCP is the endoscopic, okay, so that's the tube going down, um, tube going down the throat. This is called the endoscopic retrograde choleangiopancreatography, a very, very long word, um, long term that many of you may have taken care of patients that are status post ERCP um, or are going for an ERCP to rule out any kind of hepatobiliary dysfunction. So the ERCP is endoscopic visualization, whereas the MRCP is, is visualization using film, okay? Um, let's talk about the ERCP for a minute. So for patients going for an ERCP, um, we need to make sure that they're NPO for several hours prior, okay? It's not going to be an NPO for three hours prior. We want to make sure that they're NPO for several hours prior, preferably after midnight. So you may see NPO after midnight in preparation for this, okay? Um, moderate sedation is going to be used during this procedure. Patients, they need to be very still and cooperative for the endoscope to actually go down and reach the biliary tree. So, you know, this isn't just a quick scope um, to the stomach or into the, you know, bronchoscope. This is a, a, you know, a rather extensive procedure, but they need to be cooperative and they need to be still um, for it to reach the biliary tree for visualization. All right. So um, during this procedure, it's the nurse's responsibility to... Um, monitor for the respiratory and CNS depression, okay? So we want to be monitoring them for their respiratory system, taking a look at their O2 sets, their respiratory rate, um, as well as CNS depression. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at any hypotension, so any complications of um, their blood pressure. We're looking at specifically hypotension during the procedure. Um, Post-procedure, um, so what we're going to look at post-procedure when the patient comes back from it we want to look for any signs and symptoms of perforation, um, so that peritonitis, right? Any kind of rupture there, um, signs and symptoms of infection, as well as in the immediate post-op when they come to the floor, we need to check for a gag reflex prior to eating or drinking. Some of you guys may think, you know, once my patient comes back from surgery, they can eat or drink. You know, we're going to start them on a, you know, liquids or a full diet. This is something that's going down their throat, which we numb their gag reflex for. So it, you, gotta, you can't give them anything by mouth until you've tested for the return of their gag reflex so that they don't aspirate those foods and fluids and it goes into their lungs and you just caused a respiratory problem on top of a, a biliary problem, okay? So post-procedure, we're looking at any signs and symptoms of complication from the surgery, which is perforation, right? Like that peritonitis, um, infection, as well as checking for the return of the gag reflex before eating or drinking, okay? Um, dietary management. So 80% of patients with acute gallbladder, like an acute cholecystitis, 80% of patients can recover from this um, and rest, okay? So really, it's not, it's a very common surgery that we have it's not very complex you know there's a high success rate with it in terms of um you know following the guidelines with recovery and resting so after having a cholecystectomy we're going to put them on supportive fluids right the iv fluids they're possibly going to have an ng tube for um decompression of the stomach we're going to put them on analgesics and we're going to put them on the antibiotics okay to help prevent any of those post-op complication um infections or anything like that. Make sure that you guys watch my Picmonic. Um, I'm a big fan of the the point, the course point plus, not only the interactive case studies, but as well as the Picmonics. As you saw, I did have a test question from my reproductive that was picked right from the, the Picmonics um, from the last quiz. So um, one of my Picmonics is uh, Coley 
uh, cholecystectomy interventions, which kind of explains it nicely on what we do post-op, okay? Um, but back to dietary management. So following an episode of a cholecystitis, we want to make sure that the patient's following a strict diet, low-fat diet, um, liquids, and a very bland diet. So making sure that there's nothing stimulating, nothing too stimulating to the, um, the GI system. We really want them to avoid eggs, avoid cream, um, like any kind of creamy foods, avoid fried foods, gassy foods, gassy foods or gassy vegetables. Okay, I know veggies are great, but gassy veggies, we really want to stay away from, like your Brussels sprouts, um, cauliflower, broccoli, um, and no fatty foods. It's very important, no fatty foods. Um, medications that we can give. So when we're looking at med management, um, the Actigol, I'm going to call it Actigol because this is a very hard word to say. The generics are always difficult to say. The ursodeoxycholic acid, I'd rather say the brand name Actigol. Although I will note that in your end class. So guys, I apologize for that last slide. It cut me off and I cannot go back and redo it because I think that was like a five minute slide and I don't want to go back and redo it. So I'm just going to finish up from the prior slide, which is the medication management. All right, I'm going to talk about it on this slide and then I'll go right into the non-surgical removal of the gallstones. But I do have to say, I'm sitting here doing a voiceover PowerPoint. And the reason why I got interrupted was because my kids just came off of the bus from school. They get home about five of three. And my youngest just came in flying through the door and saying, um, apparently there's been something happening at Hudson Valley. There's been a stabbing. <laughs> So I think the whole like capital district knows about what's going on at Hudson Valley right now. Um, I just think you kind of have to laugh. He says, is that why you're home? I said, yes. <laughs> okay, so let me finish Wait, up. Can I see? Nope. Let me finish up by talking about the, the medical management um, with the medical management for the cholelithiasis, specifically the meds. So the actical, remember I talked about ways that we can dissolve those small stones, which are the cholesterol stones. It can be done so doing using the actical, okay, which is that urso deoxycholic acid, okay, used to dissolve small stones. I want to emphasize that small stones, all right? So if you have stones that are in larger size, um, you know, that may not be candidates for this, then the medication's not going to work, right? It's not going to be effective. The thing, the teaching when it comes to the UDCA, which is the abbreviation for this medi um, me the medication, is that it's to be given over six to 12 months. So patients need to be taking this for about six to 12 months in order for it to dissolve the stones. And it can help prevent the occurrence of the symptoms, right? That the epigastric pain, uh, right upper quadrant pain, the bloating, especially after eating foods that are high in fatty, all right? Um, this method of treatment, the medications, um, it's used for patients that aren't surgical candidates, okay? Or those that refuse surgery. So patients can refuse the surgery and they wanna go for the medical management, which is the, the UDCA. Um, so we're going to use this method of treatment for patients who just aren't going to be able to survive the surgery um, and have a lot of other comorbidities or those that just flat out refuse the surgery. The success rate for this prescription street treatment is low. Um, recurrence of symptoms are high. So like I said, it's not great. It can help with the symptoms, probably not with the long term unless the patient has some serious modifications in their lifestyle. Okay, and then non-surgical removal we're going to talk about on this slide. Um, so, non-surgical removal of the gallstones. So this can be, and I also said the dissolution of the stones. So dissolving of the stones through means of the UDCA, or we can um, infuse a solvent into the gallbladder through either a tube or a catheter that's inserted uh, percutaneously into the gallbladder, okay? So it's infusing of a solvent through um, into the gallbladder through one of these tubes or catheters that we do percutaneously um, into the gallbladder. Um, th these are also used for patients that not are not surgical candidates. 
okay? Um, stone removal by instrumentation. Um, these use endoscopic procedures to retrieve the stone. So it's using endoscopic visualization to kind of go in with different maneuvers and manually removing the stone, okay? So there's th different kinds, you know, those used with a basket um, or through the T-tube. Um, all of these with the instrumentation that is done endoscopically, we need to make sure that we're observing our patient's po um, intra-procedurally, so during the procedure, as well as post-procedure for any bleeding and perforation. Okay, like I said, perforation is going to be kind of a big deal um, in terms of this. Another way um, to non-surgically remove the gallstones is by um, breaking up the stones, right? You guys remember learning about how to break up the uh, kidney stones, right? Um, renal calculi. Same kind of concept with um, gallstones, the cholelithiasis. Um, so we've got uh, lithotripsy. Um, or extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, as well as the intracorporeal lithotripsy. So the intracorporeal lithotripsy, this uses pulsating laser technology to help break up or fragment the stone. Okay. Um, so this is going to be using pulsating laser technology to help break up and minimize that stone so that it can be passed. Okay. However, repeated treatments of this. So you may need repeated treatments of this intracorporeal lithotripsy um, in order for it to um, work. So you may have repeated treatments based on the stone size or if they're having like technical difficulties, like everywhere they do have. So it may not be a one and done type of a deal, like surgery. Whereas um, the lithotripsy or the ESWL, the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, um, this is also a, a way of you, it's used for non-surgical treatment of stones. Um, this is where we use repeated shock waves um, directed into the gallbladder and the common bile duct to help fragment the stones, like we said, which can then be passed spontaneously. Um, this lithotripsy or the ESWL, this allows for no incision, no hospitalization, um, but several sessions are going to be necessary for this. Um, this has been largely replaced by uh, the lap coli, um, but it's also a good method for patients who aren't surgical candidates. So people who can't go for the lap coli, um, they may be a candidate for these shockwave therapy where we can help break up the stone, okay? So we may, we you know, it's not our treatment of choice. You know, our, our treatment of choice is the lap coli, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about on the next slide. But you have to keep in mind patients that aren't candidates. You know, these really sick people that are, not a candidate for general surgery or um, any, you know, any kind of surgical procedure whatsoever. They may be candidates um, for all these non-surgical procedures, whether it's by stone removal using instrumentation or the laser therapy or the dissolution therapy. Okay. All right. The lap coli. Um, so lap coli we can schedule the patient for a lap coli or it can be delayed until symptoms subside. Okay, so we may be doing the lap coli that's scheduled. Once uh, symptoms subside, they may have it scheduled um, or it may be like an emergent situation, okay? So during the lap coli, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, the surgeon makes these four small incisions that are less than a half inch each. So they're very tiny. We call them uh, stab wounds, totally you know, appropriate for today. Little stab wounds, um, four small incision marks that are less than a half inch um, in the abdomen. Um, during the procedure, the abdominal cavity, it's filled with CO2, right? So we pump up the, the cavity with CO2 kind of make everything lighter and push it away that aids in the visualization of the organs um, for the surgeon to see. Okay, so if you have the luxury of having a pre-op situation, so if we can schedule the patient for it, 
um, whether it be delayed for the next day or, you know, schedule it for two weeks in advance. Um, we want to make sure that we get some stuff preoperatively. Uh, we want to get a chest X-ray, an EKG, as well as the um, LFTs, get some of their liver function tests. Um, we want to make sure that we look at their coagulation. So if their PT levels are, are low, remember we talked about the risk for bleeding, especially with the vitamin K deficiencies. So if their PT levels are low, we're going to want to give them some vitamin K to correct it, right? We don't want to send them into surgery with those low levels. Um, so preoperatively, make sure that we have all of our things um, set. Chest x-ray, EKG, um, get some blood work, specifically the liver function tests and your coagulations. Um, we want to try to educate the patient as much as possible prior to going into the surgery. So what they can expect post-op, right? Because we really want to prevent um, post-op pneumonia. And we also want to educate them on the possible need for, when they're going for laparoscopic, we may need to open them up, okay? So they may need an open abdominal surgery. Laparoscopic is great until we get in there and we see this can't be done laparoscopically. So instead of bringing the, pulling the patient out of anesthesia and saying, oh, we need to go back in and do an open abdominal surgery, we want to get consent for that and educate the patient that in, you know, uh, last resort scenarios, last case scenarios, in the event we can't achieve what we want to achieve by doing this laparoscopically, we may need to open them up and do open abdominal um, removal of the gallbladder, okay? So with that, it's a little bit more complex. So we want to make sure that the patients are more prepared because they may come out of surgery with drainage tubes, NG tubes. Um, you know, they're going to be in a lot more pain with an open abdominal incision versus the three, uh, four small laparoscopic incisions, okay? And it's gonna be more of a hospitalization. So preoperatively, we wanna make sure that we emphasize those points. No matter what procedure, we're gonna to wanna to do some post-op prevention of pneumonia, so coughing, deep breathing, all of that stuff, as well as um, if we need to have an ab open abdominal um, cholecystectomy that they may be coming out with some drains um, and devices, okay? The, one of the benefit though of the lap cholecy, like I said, it's less abdominal pain postoperatively. It's much more manageable. Um, there's a decreased risk, almost next to no risk of an ileus. Um, and the patients are often discharged the same day or next day. So you may even have a lap coli in the morning and go home that evening. You know, it's like totally fast, fast food service for lap colis. Um, so it's, it's fast. Um, there's, Lit, lit, very little pain, right? Less abdominal pain. I won't say very little pain, but less abdominal pain than the traditional open. And there's a decrease to no risk of the ileus um, from developing that we talked about, okay? But one of the most serious complications, I won't say it's a picture perfect procedure because nothing is. One of the most com serious complications with a lap coli is the bile duct injury, okay? So we wanna make sure that we're sending them home if it is same day, uh, sending them home with information regarding what to look for if there is some kind of a bile duct injury. Okay, um, so provide them some education about managing post-op pain, monitor for signs and symptoms of complications. So loss of appetite, um, any vomiting or distension of their abdomen, as well as increased temp, okay? Also, keep in mind with the laparoscopic procedure, Gas pain after surgery, this is gonna be real. They may not feel pain in the incisions because they're so small, but they may feel, oh my God, these gas pains are unbearable, okay? Because all of that CO2 that they blew the patient's abdominal cavity, cavity up with, it needs to get reabsorbed and then expelled through the body, okay? So the best way to get rid of those gas pain relief is ambulate, right? Get them up, moving around, it's gonna help move that gas throughout our body and out. Um, or offer uh, them a heating pad um, if it radiates up into their shoulder, which you can see some shoulder pain associated with the lap procedures. Um, surgical intervention for biliary disease is the most common operative procedure in the older adult. So the concern for that is um, septic shock, which is accompanied by um, the signs and symptoms of septic shock, oliguria, right? So 
peeing small amounts. So not having good output, just small amounts of urine output, hypotension, mental status changes, tachycardia, and tachypnea, okay? So um, we want to look for any kind of uh, signs and symptoms of septic shock post-procedure, especially within the older adult population. All right, guys, I promise you we're getting through this. It's going to be smooth sailing from here now that we have the, the concepts underway. So nursing care, uh, nursing process, care of the patient with a cholelithiasis. Um, so assessment, right? First step in the nursing process is the assessment. Well, we want to do um, PAT, um, pre-admission testing, um, if it can be, you know, if our patient's scheduled for the lap coli. Um, we want to do the pre-admission testing one week prior if it's not an emergent situation. So making sure that we get all those diagnostics, the chest x-ray, the blood work. Um, we want to get a, a patient a full history of it. We want to get an EKG. Um, we want to do some teaching. Um, so take a look at their knowledge and educational needs, okay? Getting them prepped for surgery, um, making sure that they avoid certain types of foods to trigger another attack. Um, making sure that they know what to expect postoperatively, as well as avoiding smoking and avoiding any of their co anticoagulation meds. So aspirin, NSAIDs, um, and over-the-counter herbal remedies that can affect bleeding. We want to make sure that they're avoiding those prior to the surgery. We don't want to send them into surgery being on heparin or, or their aspirin or anything that can prolong their bleeding. Okay, um, so make sure that you're doing that teaching with them prior to the procedure. Okay, um, a respiratory status. So we want to do a baseline respiratory assessment on them and look for any risk factors for respiratory complications post-op. So remember, one of the biggest things that we look at with the post-op is pneumonia as well as the VTE, right? All your basic med surge stuff. Um, but we want to make sure that they're not going to be complicated post-operatively from a pneumonia. So look for any risk factors that they may have in terms of smoking or any kind of um, pulmonary disease and teach them about prevention measures with pneumonia, coughing, deep breathing, instead of spirometer, getting them up to ambulate someone and so forth, okay? Um, you want to do a nutritional status, so you're going to want to do an, a nutritional assessment on them, see what it is that they're able to, you know, tolerate eating or what they're not able to tolerate, um, as well as what to expect postoperatively. Monitor for any potential bleeding because they are going to have these vitamin deficiencies, okay? And then to be looking after laparoscopic surgery um, at the GI symptoms, okay? So we're going to be assessing for any of these, um, the shock um, that we talked about. So the loss of appetite, vomiting, pain, distension, and fever, um, which can be either a potential infection um, like sepsis or a disruption of the GI tract, right? Like the perforation, um, which we, we talked about. All right, next step in the nursing process after assessment is our diagnoses. And these are our nursing diagnoses, right? So NANDA, Nick and Knock, right? So our NANDA nursing diagnoses are the acute pain, impaired gas exchange, impaired skin integrity, imbalanced nutrition, deficient knowledge, right? Nick and Knock are going to be our outcomes and then our interventions. So what can we do for the acute pain? Right, we're going to want to relieve the pain. Remember I said in one of our beginning slides, analgesics and morphine, right? We're going to want to make sure that we get some pain relief under control with them. Administer analgesics. Um, this is going to help allow the patient to fully expand their lungs to help prevent for complications, okay? Now, one of the things you may see with our patients um, that I, I didn't really talk about when it came to pain and when it came to breathing was... Patients may not be able to take a full deep breath in on inspiration. So when you're doing that respiratory assessment and you're listening to their lungs, they may have a hard time with taking that full inspiratory volume because it's going to cause some of that pain um, in their right around their ribs. Um, so they may not have like a full expansion of their lungs during that um, during your respiratory assessment, which may be a key indicator of, gee, I think it may have some gallstone stuff going on here, all right? And then also, when we're talking in terms of post-op, right, we want to be able to relieve their pain so that they can do all the pulmonary exercises, so the coughing and deep breathing, 
splinting can help reduce pain and, and also enhance those respiratory, um, the respiratory status. So that kind of, I feel like goes uh, along the, or hand in hand with the impaired gas exchange and the acute pain. You kind of, you need to manage the pain in order to have effective um, pulmonary interventions in order to not have an impaired gas exchange, we need to make sure that we're monitor, you know, keeping their pain level un under control. All right, so impaired skin integrity um, and promoting drainage. So a lot of what this what this talks about is not just impaired skin integrity in terms of your surgical incision, right? Yeah, we know that. We know that there is an impaired skin integrity, and we know that there is going to be a surgical incision that we're going to monitor for bleeding, monitor for signs of infection, making sure it's clean, dry, and intact, reinforce the dressing, blah, 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 right? But we also want to keep in mind if they have any drainage devices, because like I said, there may be a risk for coming out with an NG tube or some kind of a drainage device that we need to be monitoring for. And we need to know that some of these devices um, can be corrosive to the skin, okay? So you want to make sure that the drainage tube that's connected um, is connected to the drainage receptacle, uh, receptacle. So, you know, this is your 60 second assessment, tubes and drains, making sure that the drains are connected to the appropriate devices, okay? Um, so you wanna make sure that we fastened our tubing to the gown and ensure that there's no kinks or occlusions within the, the system. You wanna make sure that we change the dressing PRN to the drain sites, okay? so. Looking at the dressing around those drain sites and changing the dressing PRN and whenever it's ordered um, to those sites, as well as monitoring the skin around the drainage site because the bile is very highly corrosive to the skin, okay? So you need to make sure if there's any kind of drainage device coming out, it needs to not be against the skin. It's gonna totally corrosive um, the skin. Um, if a T-tube is in place, um, which is drainage to the common bile duct, you need to make sure that we're monitoring the output. So the amount, the color, and the consistency. So all in all, um, we want to be looking at accurate I's and O's, right? This is where our I's and O's come into play, um, as well as monitoring it for signs and symptoms of infection. So we're looking at that output, um, the drainage output, um, not only for fluid volume purposes, but also for infection purposes. So we're looking for any purulent or pussy-like drainage, okay, that would indicate an infection. Obviously, um, I'm sorry, nutrition, before I was going to talk about deficient knowledge. So nutrition. Um, so we want patients on diets that are low fat, high carbs, high proteins immediately after surgery. Um, now, if you, you may find some... Um, differential reading where you may see in some spots it's it's low fats um high carbs low proteins and this all depends on where they are within the gallbladder attack so if they're in between acute attacks um then we may want to put them on a um low fat um high carbs low proteins right if they're in in an attack itself okay but once they're in between attacks once they're good as well as post-op, then we can immediately start them on uh, low-fat, high-carbs, high-proteins, okay? Because we, we want to remember the high-protein levels, um, once they are post-op and we've taken care of the, the biliary issue, it's going to help promote the skin healing, okay? Um, but when they're having the gallbladder attack, we don't want high proteins, right? Because we don't want all of that, um, the biliary breakdown when it comes to proteins, um, but once we've resolved the problem, we're going to put them on that low fat, high carbs, high protein diet. Okay. And when we're discharging them, make sure that they know to maintain that healthy diet and avoid any fatty foods. Um, just because we took the gallbladder out doesn't mean they can go back to eating what it was that put them here in the first place. Okay. So, um, healthy diet, healthy lifestyles. Okay. These interventions and diagnostics, these just go all hand in hand with the diagnoses that I went through. Okay. Our goals, relief of pain, adequate ventilation, intact skin, improve our biliary drainage. If they do come out with some drainage devices, um, optimal nutritional intake, um, absence of complications, right? Absence of complications like our, um, pneumonia, 
VTE prophylaxis, um, infection, um, any kind of digestive disturbances. So we want to not only monitor them for this, but make sure that they know what to monitor for when they go home, right? Understanding self-care routines. Um, so these things, I just want to point you to right here, the self-care edu education. Um, oh, I thought I changed it all. It's actually 44.2. Our old Brunner book must have been chapter 50 because I've seen 50 everywhere and it's actually chapter 44. So the self-care education um, chart, this is our all of our discharge instructions. So we need to make sure that patients have an understanding of what's going on when they go home, okay? And this little chart is nice for what it is that we're educating them on. And what we're educating them on is everything that we just talked about, all those diagnoses, all those potential problems. So managing their pain, resuming their activity, um, caring for the wound, right? Um, resuming what to eat, that healthy diet, um, as well as any follow-up care. So we need to make sure that they have an understanding of this. And it really goes align in alignment with everything that we're already looking for with them when it comes to their diagnoses and their outcomes, okay? It's just making sure that they know what to do, when to call the doctor if there's a concern, and that they have that follow-up care. All right. I will just say, though, I'll go over some of these points in the slide. The low fowler position. Now, one of the reasons why we put them in that low fowler's position and why positioning is so important is because of the effects of the, um, you know, the biliary system and the inflammation. Honey, shh. The um, inflammation of the biliary system can kind of press on that diaphragm. Um, so we want to try to decrease the amount of pressure that's already pressing on that um, the diaphragm by placing them in like a low fowler's position. So you don't really want them in high fowlers. I don't want you to get confused though. Well, what if they have an NG tube? We can't lay them flat, right? You know, we're not saying we're gonna lay them supine. Um, if they have an NG tube, then it's gonna be different, right? We need to make sure that they're at least 30 or above. Um, but we want to maintain like a low to semi, semi, semi fowlers which will help with that decompression of the diaphragm, which can help aid in their ventilation and their, their breathing, okay? Um, they may have an NG tube or they may be NPO until the bowel sounds return. And then we wanna make sure we can start them on that soft, low fat, high carb, high protein diet. Caring for the biliary drainage system, I already talked to you about that. Monitor the skin around the drainage system, make sure there's a barrier to that and that the bile isn't, going right directly onto the skin because it's just going to tear it away. Um, analgesics, pain management, and all of those pulmonary toileting techniques, turning, coughing, deep breathing, splinting, get them up, moving around, okay? So potential complications. And you know what, guys? We have really have already discussed this. I think we know what to do. The three major complications um, are common. I'll say common complications are bleeding, GI symptoms, and our general med surge atelectasis thrombo and thrombophlebitis. Um, so we're going to monitor them for any bleeding. And I told you that we're going to monitor them during the procedure, right? Especially if they had an ERCP um, or during the lap or open coli, monitor them for signs and symptoms of bleeding. So monitor their vital signs, right? Um, monitor their heart rate, monitor their blood pressure. If there are signs of bleedings, then their, their the heart rate's going to go up. Blood pressure is going to go down. Respirations are going to go up, right? They're going to become tacky, tachypnic, tachycardic, hypotensive. Um, but we also want to look for any overt signs of bleeding. So monitor the dressing. Uh, monitor the drains for the presence of blood. You know, if they have a Foley, um, they may or may not have a Foley. Depending on the patient, monitor the urinary output for, for any bleeding. Um, monitor the, the hat in the bathroom for any bleeding. So look for any overt signs of bleeding. Um things that you can see as well as for any internal bleeding as well, okay? Um, GI symptoms, so that's that perforation that I was talking about, perforation and infection. So you wanna uh, assess for the any tenderness and, and rigidity uh, to the abdomen and report it to the physician. So remember, rigidity and tenderness to the abdomen may be a sign of peritonitis, um, which can be a result from a perforation, okay? So you not only wanna be assessing for this, but when we're sending them home, educate them on the, the risk of, um, or, or what to look for, right? So reporting any changes in color of their stool, elevated temp, nausea, vomiting, and that abdominal pain. Any of those symptoms there, we wanna make sure that they're reporting it to the, the surgeon right away. 
and make sure that they follow up with their surgeon in seven to 10 days once released from the hospital, okay? You can't always assume every patient has a primary care physician, right? Some patients may be coming into the hospital that, um, you know, the Joe Schmo that you don't know who it is um, that may need to get their gallbladder removed. We're, we're discharging them and they may not have a primary care. So you wanna make sure that they see follow-up care, that they're set up with follow-up care with a surgeon in seven to 10 days once they're released from the hospital. And that's gonna be a job for case management and social worker to set them up with, okay? All right, guys, we're on the last leg of this lecture. So the pancreas. So let's, we already talked about the anatomy and physiology of the pancreas. So there's um, pancreatitis, right, which can be either acute or a chronic. And pancreatitis is literally just the inflammation of the pancreas, okay? It sounds simple. Well, it's just inflammation of the pancreas, but this is a very serious disorder, okay? And when we think of pancreatitis, um, this actually is a, a very serious complication which may involve intensive care okay depending on the, the presentation of the patient and what's going on with them okay but there's an acute pancreatitis and then there's a chronic pancreatitis so your acute pancreatitis um is life-threatening with an increased risk for mortality okay you know this is where the the pancreatic duct becomes obstructed and the enzymes back up causing auto digestion and inflammation of the pancreas Okay, um, your chronic pancreatitis patients, this can go undetected uh, because the initial symptoms and the diagnostic findings may not be present in the early stages of the, um, of the pancreatitis, of the disease, of the inflammation of the pancreas. So um, they may not be present in the early stages or they may be thought to be something else, right? They may be uh, mistaken to be, oh, that was that, or I had a GI bug or I had that, right? So um, they may not find um, any, or, or the, the chronic pancreatitis can be overlooked for some time until they come in and then they're very ill, okay? Acute pancreatitis doesn't usually automatically lead to chronic, okay, unless complications develop. So somebody can have an acute pancreatitis. Um, an acute episode of pancreatitis and if they clean up their act or whatever it was that caused it right um it doesn't automatically lead into having chronic problems right they can kind of reverse it however the flip side patients that have chronic pancreatitis they can have acute episodes so you can have think of it with kidney injury right you think of somebody that has acute kidney injury um they may have chronic kidney disease right? Maybe end-stage renal with an, with an AKI, an acute kidney injury. Same thing with the chronic pancreatitis. They may have a history of chronic pancreatitis with flare-ups, so acute episodes. They're having an acute pancre pancreatic attack on top of a chronic pancreatitis disorder, okay? So um, what happens is the, the pancreatic duct becomes obstructed. It leads to the hypersecretion of those exocrine enzymes in the pancreas that we talked about earlier, these enzymes in the bile back up into the pancreatic duct and they cause inflammation. 80% um, of causes of acute pancreatitis is the result of cholelithiasis, which we just talked about, or sustained alcohol abuse, okay? And the acute can range from mild to severe and can be classified as uh, interstitial edematous pancreatitis or necrotizing pancreatitis, which is more your severe, okay? Your necrotizing pancreatitis, those patients are gonna land a seat into the, land a bed in the, in the ICU or the CCU. Whereas your uh, more milder are interstitial edematous pancreatitis, okay? The edema and the inflammation um, in the interstitial is confined to the pancreas, um, but Patients can be at risk for hypovolemic shock. Um, they can also be at risk for fluid and electrolyte imbalances and sepsis, okay? They still can be at risk for that. I don't want you to think, oh, well, they're fine. Um, it is a more milder way and it can reverse it, um, but it can lead to more serious complications. Whereas the necrotizing pancreatitis, which is the most severe form, is the presence of tissue necrosis in the pancreas itself, okay? The enzymes damage the local blood vessels 
and bleeding and thrombosis occurs, okay? Which then leads to complications like hypoxia, GI bleed, MODS, and then ultimately um, shock, okay? So when patients are admitted, um, we look at the Ranson criteria for pancreatic mortality. And this is going to be, I said the chart there um, on 44.3. Take a look at that chart. It's very interesting um, because there's criteria for pancreatic mortality. Um, they look at a couple of different things for at, on admission, um, like what the patient's age is, what their white blood cell count is. They also look at their glucose. Then they look at their liver enzymes, like the ASC, the ALT, and their cholesterol levels. And then we admit them, right? So we look at some of those levels and admit them with a possible pancreatitis. And then within 48 hours, we look at a couple different things and we look at the changes in their labs. So just for an example, you know, we look at, has there been a, a, a sudden, well, not sudden, but within 48 hours, a decrease in more than 10% of their hematocrit um, and so on and so forth. It kind of goes on and on. And are they meeting that criteria? If they're eligible and meeting that criteria, the more their risk of mortality is goes up, which is where they may fall along the lines of a critical care. Okay, so that chart is really interesting to look at. Okay, so clinical manifestations of pancreatitis, uh, pain, guarding, respiratory distress, okay? Severe abdominal pain, this is your major symptom. Um, patients may have tenderness and back pain. Um, so they may have, like remember you guys learned about with the renal pain, right, the lower back pain, um, they may have tenderness and back pain from the irritation and edema from, the, from just an inflamed pancreas, okay? Pain can also be found mid-epigastric and acute, okay? Can be acute in the onset, lasting like two to three days following either a very heavy meal or an increased alcoholic ingestion. So if they went on a binge, a, a weekend binge party or binging, um, they may find two to three days in the following week they may have this mid-epigastric or even that lower lower back pain, all from an inflamed pancreas, okay? Um, but severe abdominal pain is going to be one of your major symptoms. Um, they are going to be positive for abdominal guarding um, when you go to palpate and assess them. Um, also, vomiting with no relief of the nausea, okay? So they may um, vomit, and they, some patients, when you're thinking of other uh, you know, comorbidities or other um, diseases and diagnoses, it may relieve some of the nausea that they're having or, in, or pain. Um, but this vomiting with no relief of that is going to be symptomatic with pancreatitis, okay? Um, bloating, bloating as well, so that abdominal distension. But I want you to know that the, the very common clinical manifestation with this besides the pain is the nausea and vomiting, okay? Now, they may also have uh, some ecchymosis around the belly button region. This is going to be within with severe pancreatitis cases. You may see that bruising around the the embolicus. Um, respiratory distress and hypoxia are common. Okay, and this is because of the inflammation, the pancreas that's um, pressing on the diaphragm. Um, so they may have respiratory distress and hypoxia when we look at their ABGs. Um, hypocalcemia. They're going to have a low calcium, um, low, you know, low calcium, low albumin in their chem profile. They're going to have abnormal ABGs, right? You're going to find that they're hypoxic. Um, they're going to be dyspneic, tachypnea. So they're going to have difficulty breathing, rapid ventilation rate. So over 20, you're going to find that they're hyperglycemic, right? Because their insulin's all skewy, their insulin sensitivity. So you're going to find that they have high blood sugars. And DIC can ultimately occur. So disseminated intravascular coagulation, um, which is can be life-threatening, okay? So those are all accompanying clinical manifestations with that. So diagnostic findings, um, we want to get a patient history, right? Just like with everything, we want to get a history of the presence of any known risk factors. Um, we want to look at their labs, serum and lipase levels specifically, Um uh, amylase and lipase levels can be elevated, usually about 24 hours after the onset of symptoms, but they can also return to normal within 48 to 72 hours. The lipase remains elevated longer than the amylase. So looking at um, where the patient falls in the timeline of a flare-up, just remember 
the uh, the amylase and the lipase they can be elevated 24 hours after the onset of the symptoms and then the amylase will return to normal but then your lipase um will be elevated for a longer period of time okay um within that three two to two to three days um you also want to get an x-ray we want to get a cat scan um we want to get an ultrasound something to visualize the pancreas okay and make sure that we're monitoring their H and H for the bleeding. So medical management, it's gonna be aimed at relieving the symptoms and preventing or treating the complications. So we wanna put them in PO, NPO to prevent the stimulation of the pancreas and the secretion of those enzymes. Um, possibly get an NG tube to help relieve that initial nausea and vomiting and decrease their risk of a paralytic ileus, right? So we're gonna help that decompression of the stomach. Um, prevent any infectious complications. Um, so, um, you know, possibly some antibiotics. If the patient can't tolerate enteral feedings for their nutrition, um, we may, may need parenteral feeds, okay? So if they can't tolerate anything um, orally or enterally, we may need to go to the TPN route um, to keep their nutritional balances, okay? And medical management, we're gonna put them on some H2 antagonists like your cimetidine, uh, ranitidine or our PPIs. Okay, we're going to get them on board. Um, so that's our medical management with it. Our nursing management, we're going to make sure we're, we're administering adequate analgesics for that acute pancreatitis, right? So this is our morphine, fentanyl, and dilaudid. Um, these are all best given through a PCA because you are going to be giving them frequently. Um, pain is, is going to be a severe thing with these patients. So a little bit of oxycodone or Tylenol probably isn't going to cut it. Um, we need some strong morphine, fentanyl, and dilaudid, and possibly a PCA pump in order to get them some pain control. We're going to want to give them some antiemetics for nausea and vomiting, so some Venergan, Zofran, Compazine. No oral feedings to help prevent that uh, secretion of the secretin hormone and all of those, um, the stimulation of the pancreatic hormones. Um, so nothing orally. Um, IV fluids with electrolytes, making sure we are monitoring the NG tube. Um, if the patient's confused, so if they're having some um, disorientation within the CNS status, which they can have, um, frequent and repeated but simple explanations, okay? So frequent, repeated, simple explanations. No lengthy terms, no lengthy conversations. Reorient them. We want to put them on bed rest to help decrease that metabolic rate and decrease the secretion of the pancreatic and gastric enzymes. Um, so help just to kind of slow everything down, all that metabolism and the secretion of those enzymes that are all awry. Um, Semi-followers and changes in position to help prevent the atelectasis and pooling of those respiratory secretions. So you want to make sure that we're um, monitoring their respiratory status as well, okay? Okay, so nursing care, the nursing process, care for the patient with acute pancreatitis. So our nursing diagnoses, kind of similar to our cholelithiasis, right? We've got our acute pain, um, ineffective breathing pattern, imbalanced nutrition, impaired skin integrity. It's all very similar to the cholelithiasis and the reason being too, okay? So acute pain, we already said we want to get them on board with some analgesics, right? Some good analgesics. Um, ineffective breathing pattern, right? Making sure that we're monitoring their um, hypoxia, monitoring their ABGs, um, looking for any dyspnea or tachypnea. Um, nutritional status, making sure that we're monitoring their labs and their electrolytes, making sure we're getting a daily weight on them. You know, the daily weights are important, not just for your renal and heart failure patients. It's also for our, our pancreatitis patients. Um, monitor their serum glucose levels, right? Especially after acute episodes, okay? Um, we want to make sure that they're increasing their protein, lowering their fat intake, um, avoiding any alcohol, especially after the acute phases, right? Um, high, le, or high protein, uh, low fat, no alcohol. Um, we want to monitor their skin integrity, especially because of their poor nutritional status, right? So these patients are 
um, generally not eating, um, they have a poor nutritional status because they find that they're not eating because of fear of having one of these attacks. So they're malnourished. It's not only that they, they may they may not eat the best, but they also may not be eating, period, because of fear of having a flare-up, okay? So having this poor nutritional status, that low calcium, low protein, um, puts them at risk for poor skin integrity, right? Poor healing. Um, so you're not, you're going to want to monitor their skin integrity, not even, not only with having a drainage device post-op, but patients that are pre-op um, that have this complication, um, this chart 44 for in Brunner, um, this is a care plan for acute pancreatitis. And I love it because it really goes through and it goes through this whole diagnosis of all of these, as well as your interventions and outcomes of each and every one of these. So I'm just going to refer to that. It's actually page 1434 in your Brunner 15th edition. And I was gonna pull that up in class, but I'm not gonna pull it up for here. So just make sure you guys read that. I think it's about three pages long. It's the care plan for these diagnoses with the acute pancreatitis. All right, potential problems, um, collaborative problems and potential complications um, when it comes to your acute pancreatitis. Um, fluid and electrolyte imbalances. This is very common, right? Because of the nausea and vomiting. Um, that the patient's having. So nausea and vomiting predisposes us to having like a medical, a metabolic alkalosis, right? As well as fluid and electrolyte shifts. Um, that as well as the use of gastric suction. So if your patient is on an NG tube, right? It's gonna cause some changes in our fluid and electrolyte. So we wanna make sure that we're monitoring their labs, um, monitoring their skin turgor for any fluid deficiencies, um, mucous membranes, making sure we're getting their weight. Um, give them IV fluids, right, supplemental fluids, and possibly blood products, especially if they've had some blood loss, okay? We want to be monitoring for the necrosis of the pancreas, which, remember, the necrotizing um, pancre pancreas is a major cause of morbidity and mortality because it can result in hemorrhage. It can result in hemorrhage, septic shock, and MODs. So if they have... Um, any necrosis of the pancreas, we're going to be admitting them to the ICU CCU to help prevent any of these um, associated symptoms with the, the necrotic pancreas. All right. And lastly, we're going to uh, finish it up with chronic pancreatitis. So pro chronic pancreatitis, thank God we're getting to the end of this because I'm starting to stutter and slur my words. Chronic pancreatitis is um, the progressive deterioration of the pancreas. So it's, it's a chronic in nature, progressive destruction of that um, organ, right? Those cells are replaced with fibrous tissue after the reported attacks, which places the increased pressure on the pancreas and can cause obstruction in the pancreas as well as the common bile duct. Okay, so all of these, um, these cells are replaced with fibrous tissue, okay? So alcohol and malnutrition are the major causes of chronic pancreatitis, okay? We see um, patients with pain in the upper abdomen and back accompanied by vomiting. Um, this occurs with attacks, so pain and vomiting. Um, malabsorption occurs later on in the disease because of the anorexia, and this is like from those patients that are not wanting to eat because of these flare-ups, because of the acute attacks that they get. Um, so patients with malabsorption issues from this um, develop the steatorrhea, which is those fatty stools, right? Because they are, they have those, um, the fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies and um, impaired fat digestion, right? They just can't break down the fat because they're deficient in those vitamins. Um, pancreatic pseudocysts um, can occur from collections of fluid that become walled off by fibrous tissue. Um, so these are like little pseudocysts, cysts filled with amylase fluid um, that develop and they become kind of secluded um, by fibrous tissue after these attacks. So they develop in about four to six weeks after an episode of an acute pancreatitis. And these are the most common pancreatic cysts found within chronic pancreatitis. That's not considered um, cancerous. So it's a benign cyst, okay? Um, 
What we can do uh, for this is what's called a, a rue en y or a pancreatico jejunostomy, which is uh, anastomosis of the pancreatic duct to the jejunum, uh, which allows for drainage of these pancreatic secretions into the jejunum, um, which can help relieve some of the, um, the destruction and the secretions. Um, the downside of the procedure for this um, would be that the pain returns, okay? So it's not like uh, it solves the problem, but the pain can come back, okay? So you may see what's called a, a rue on y procedure, which is the anastomosis of the pancreatic duct into the jejunum to help for that to um, get absorbed into the jejunum and um, absorbed and excreted throughout the body. Um, pancreatic, oh, so back to the, the pancreatic cysts, how we diagnose these are on the ultrasounds, CAT scans, or the ERCP. And like I said, the, the pancreatic cysts, um, these pseudocysts are non-malignant, okay? So they're just benign cysts filled with amylase fluid. Um, pancreatic cancer, these are different cysts, right? This is, uh, um, this pancreatic cancer is actually the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the US. So when we look at cancer as a um, topic, pancreatic cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the US. So it is becoming a more prevalent, it's gaining more attention. Some of the risk factors are smoking, exposures to toxins within the environment, and diets that are high in fat and meat, aka my husband. <laughs> um, those that love to eat that um, diets high in meat, um, fatty meats, right? Like your red meats, as well as fats um, can lead to pancreatic cancer. There is also an increase incident with um, incidence with diabetes as well. Those who have diabetes are seeing an increased incidence in the development of pancreatic cancer down the line. Okay. <coughs> so um, the malignant cells from the pancreas, and like I said, these are malignant cells. It's a malignancy. Um, the malignant cells from the pancreas shed into the peritoneal cavity, increasing the likelihood of um, metastasis. So increasing the likelihood for this to become metastatic, which is why it's really kind of um, gaining our attention because when we find that they're developed with it, it usually is progressive. Okay, so some clinical signs and symptoms of this is your typical, your pain, your jaundice, um, or both, pain and jaundice, um, with the accompaniment of weight loss. So those are your three classic signs of um, pancreatic cancer, pain, jaundice, um, with the weight loss. Okay, um, the development of ascites is common um, because of the um, inflammation into the peritoneal cavity, okay? Um, so you may be seeing that, you know, the abdominal distension may be bringing them in. Um, we also want to watch for insulin deficiency. So if they're not diabetic and all of a sudden, you know, they have these symptoms, the, the pain, jaundice, weight loss, as well as ascites, and we look and they've got glucose in their urine, um, glucosuria, hyperglycemia, right? Their blood sugars are elevated. Um, we want to be looking for any signs of insulin um, deficiency, which would be indicative of something going on with the pancreas, right? Um, so um, if they, they may not have, like I said, a, a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus, um, but Having a diagnosis of um, diabetes mellitus may be an early sign of pancreatic cancer because of all these insulin deficiencies um, that they may never have had a problem with, okay? So it may be uh, going down that route, um, that road of ruling out pancreatic cancer. So how we treat this um, would be chemo, radiation, and surgery. And I'm not going to go into chemo, radiation, or anything like the chemo and the radiation, because you guys are going to learn that in your cancer lecture, because that's pretty standard. Lastly, our Whipple procedure. So this is what we do to treat the um, pancreatic cancer, is a Whipple procedure. Um, it's used for potentially, potentially resectable cancer 
of the head of the pancreas, okay? Um, so the head of the pancreas, if there's a resectable, resectable portion of it, um, we're going to set them up with this Whipple procedure. So this is where we, if this big long term right here, the pancreatoduodenectomy, um, this is removal of the gallbladder, a portion of the stomach, duodenum, the proximal jejunum, the proximal jejunum, and the head of the pancreas, and the distal common bile duct. <laughs> so it's removing the gallbladder, portion of the stomach, duodenum, proximal jejunum, head of the pancreas, and the distal common bile duct. So there's a lot involved in the Whipple procedure. Um, Post-op management is similar to extensive GI biliary surgery, okay? We want to make sure that we're monitoring them. Um, you know, pain. Pain's going to be a big one because this is extensive surgery, right? Uh, but we're monitoring for complications, hemorrhage, vascular collapse, and any kind of hepatorenal failure. So making sure that the liver continues to function and that the kidneys continue to function. So looking for, you know, the BUN, the creatinine, all those liver function tests, any signs of, um, you know, kidney injury. So low urine output, no urine output, dark concentrated urine output, um, jaundice of the skin, you know, itchiness, puritis of the skin, things like that, that we're going to be looking for, for any kind of hepatorenal failure. And then this is just um, a picture, and this is plucked right from your Brunner book, multiple sumps after um, pancreatic surgery. So there's, they're going to have a lot of tubes and drains here, right? We're going to have an NG tube in for the compression. Um, you may have an irrigation system. So you've got your incision here. Um, you've got your irrigation tubing, um, your drainage tubing, and that's going to be connected to suction as well as your sump drains, okay? You may have a J tube for some feeding. Um, and then this is your sump drain, um, to drain and to suction, okay? So lots of sumps and drainage drainage devices here after the pancreatic. So we need to be able to manage and monitor all of these drains and devices. Okay, so that is the end of the lecture. Um, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, let me know. It is pretty, I think, explanatory. It's pretty direct um, the biliary system you know focus on your nursing interventions what what we're going to be doing for these patients I know a lot we, we talked a little bit about physiology you don't really need to have a deep understanding of the physiology you do you need to understand what's going on but think about your nursing process with it right what well, we're going to be watching the looking for the patient um looking at in the patient what the clinical manifestations are what are some nursing diagnoses what's our care plan going to be what are we going to monitor them for what are we going to teach them on um how are we going to know that they're getting better or getting worse okay so good luck guys um have a good rest of your night and i'll talk to you soon